Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostar, and Chloe. And as always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy. Hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell. And without further ado, we are going to get into the last chapter of Animal Farm. And then we're going to summarize chapters 9 and 10. And without further ado, let's get there. Chapter 10, the final chapter of Animal Farm. Years passed. The seasons came and went. The short animals lived, the, the short animals, animal lives fled by. The time came when there was no one rem who remembered the old days before the rebellion except Clover, Benjamin, Moses, the raven, and a number of the pigs. Muriel was dead. Bluebell, Jussie, and Pincher were dead. Jones, too, was dead. He had died in the, in an, in an in, inebriate's home in another part of the country. Snowball was forgotten. Boxer was forgotten, except by the few who had known him. Clover was an old stout mare now, stiff in the joints and with the tendency to roomy eyes. She was two years past the retiring age, but in fact no animal had ever actually retired. The talk of setting aside a corner of the pasture for super, superannuated animals had long since been dropped. Napoleon was now a mature boar of 24 stone. Squealer was so fat that he could, could with difficulty see out of his eyes. Only old Benjamin was much the same as ever, except for being a little grayer about the muzzle. And since Boxer's death, more morose and taciturn than ever. There were many more creatures on the farm now, though the increase was not so great as had been expected in earlier years. Many animals had been born to whom the rebellion was only a dim tradition, passed on by word of mouth, and others had been brought who had never had, had been bought who had never heard mention of such a thing before their arrival. The farm possessed three horses now, besides Clover. They were fine upstanding beasts, willing workers and good comrades, but very stupid. None of them proved able to learn the alphabet beyond the letter B. They accepted everything that they were told about the rebellion and the principles of animalism, especially from Clover for whom they had an almost filial respect, but it was doubtful whether they understood very much of it. As the farm was more prosperous now and better organized, it had even been enlarged by two fields which had been brought from Mr. Pilkington. The windmill had been successful, com successfully completed at last, and the farm possessed a threshing machine and a hay elevator of its own, and various new buildings had been added to it added to it. Wimper had bought himself a dog cart. The windmill, however, had not after all been used for generating electrical power. It was used for milling corn and brought in a handsome money profit. The animals were hard at work building yet another windmill. When there was when that one was finished, so it was said, the dynamos would be installed. But the luxuries of which Snowball had once taught the animals to dream, the stalls with electric light and hot and cold water in the three day week were no longer talked about. Napoleon had denounced such ideas as contrary to the spirit of animalism. The truest happiness, he said, lay in working hard and living frugally. Somehow it seemed as though the farm had grown richer without making the animals themselves any richer, except, of course, for the pigs and the dogs. They uh, symbolized the 1%. Perhaps this was partly because there were so many pigs and so many dogs. It was not that these creatures did not work after their fashion. There was, as Squiller was never taught, there was, as Squiller was never tired of explaining, endless work in the supervision and organization of the farm. Much of this work was of kind that the other animals were too ignorant to understand. For example, Squiller told them that the pigs had to expend enormous labors every day upon mysterious things called files, reports, minutes, and memoranda. These were very lar these were large sheets of paper which had to be closely covered with writing, and as soon as they were so covered, they were burnt in the furnace. This was of the highest importance for the welfare of the farm, Squiller said, but still another, neither pigs nor dogs produced any food by their own labor, and there were very, 
there were very many of them, and their appetites were always good. As for the others, their life so far as they knew was it as it had always been. They were generally hungry, they slept on straw, they drank from the pool, they labored in the fields in winter, they were troubled by the cold, and in summer by the flies. Sometimes the older ones among them racked their dim memories and tried to determine whether in the early days of the rebellion, when Joan's expulsion was still recent, things had been better or worse than now, they could not remember. There was nothing with which they could compare their present lives. They had nothing to go upon except Squiller's lists of figures, which invariably de demonstrated that everything was getting better and better. The animals found the problem insoluble in any case. They had little time for speculating on, much, on such things now. Only old Benjamin professed to remember every detail of his long life and to know that things never had been, nor ever could be much better or much worse. Hunger, hardship, and disappointment being, so he said, the unalterable law of life. Yet the animals never gave up hope, more they never lost. Even for an instant, their sense of honor and privilege at being members of Animal Farm, they were still the only farm in the whole country, in all England, owned and operated by animals. Not one of them, not even the youngest, not even the newcomers who had been, comers who had been brought from farm ten or twenty miles away ever ceased to marvel at that. And when they heard the gun booming and saw the green flag fluttering at the masthead, their hearts swelled with imperishable pride, and the talk turned always towards the old heroic days, the expulsion of Jones, the writing of the Seven Commandments, the great battles in which the human invaders had been defeated. None of the old dreams had been abandoned. The Republic of the Animals, which Major had foretold, when the great fields of England should be untrodden by human feet, was still believed in. Some day it was uh, coming. It might not be soon. It might not be within the lifetime of any animal now living. Still it was coming. Even the tuna beasts of England was perhaps hummed secretly here and there. At any rate, it was a fact that every animal on the farm knew it, though no one would have dared to sing it aloud. It might be that their lives were hard and that not all their hopes had been fulfilled, but they were conscious that they were not as other animals. If they were hungry, it was not from feeding tyrannical human beings. If they worked hard, at least they worked for themselves. No creature among them went upon two legs. No creatures called any other creature master. All animals were equal, well, except for Napoleon and his bunch. One day in early summer, Squealer ordered the, deep, the sheep to follow him and led them out to a piece of waste at the other end of the farm, which had become overgrown with birch saplings. The sheep spent the whole day there browsing at the leaves under Squilla's supervision. In the evening he returned to the farmhouse himself, but as it was warm weather, told the sheep to stay where they were. It ended by their remaining there for a whole week, during which time the other animals saw nothing of them. Squilla was with them for the greater part of every day. He was, he said, teaching them to sing a new song, for which privacy was needed. It was just after the sheep had returned, on a pleasant evening when the animals had finished work and were making their way back to the farm buildings, that the terrified neighing of a horse sounded from the yard. Startled, the animals stopped in their tracks. It was Clover's voice. She neighed again, and all the animals broke into a gallop and rushed into the yard. Then they saw what Clover had seen. It was a pig walking on his hind legs. So he's walking on two legs. Yes, it was Squealer, a little awkwardly, as though not quite used to supporting his considerable bulk in that position. But with perfect balance, he was strolling across the yard. And a moment later, out from the door of the farmhouse came a long file of pigs, all walking on their hind legs. Some did it better than, the other, than others. One or two were even a trifle unsteady and looked as though they would have liked the support of a stick. But every one of them made his way round the yard successfully. And finally there was a tremendous baying of dogs and a shrill crowing from the back black cockerel, and out came Napoleon himself, majestically upright, casting haughty glances from side to side and with his dogs gamboling around him. He carried a whip in his trotter. There was a deadly silence, amazed, terrified, huddling together. Now they're probably going to say, good, uh, two legs are good. <laughs> The animals uh, watched the 
long line of pigs marched slowly around the yard. It was as though the world had turned upside down. Then there came a moment when the first shock had borne off and one in spite of everything, in spite of their terror of the dogs and of the habit, developed through long years of never compl complaining, never criticizing, no matter what happened, they might have uttered some word of protest. But just at that moment, as though at a signal, all the sheep burst out into tremendous bleeding of, watch this, four legs good, two legs better. Four legs good, two legs better. Four legs good, two legs better. Wow. So now the pigs are becoming the humans. The, the species that are running the rest of the animals. Went on for five minutes without stopping, and by the time the sheep had quieted down, the chance to utter any protest had passed, for the pigs had marched back into the farmhouse. Benjamin felt the nose nuzzling at his shoulder. He looked round. It was Clover. His old, her old eyes looked dimmer than ever. Without saying anything, she tugged gently at his mare and led him round to the end of the big barn where the Seven Commandments were written. For a minute or two, they stood gazing at the tarred wall with its white lettering. My st sight is failing, she said, finally. Even when I was young, I could not, not have read what was written there. But it appears to me that the wall looks different. Are the Seven Commandments the same as they used to be, Benjamin? For once, Benjamin consented to break his rule. And he read out to her what was written on the wall. There was nothing there now except a single commandment that rang. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. <laughs> Sounds like humanity. After that, it did not seem strange when next day the pigs, who were supervising the work of the farm, all carried whips in their trotters. It did not seem strange to learn that the pigs had bought themselves a wireless set, were arranging to install a telephone, and had taken out subscriptions to John Bull, Tit Bits, and the Daily Mirror. It did not seem strange when Napoleon was seen strolling at the farmhouse garden with a pipe in his mouth, so no one, e so no, not even when the pigs took Mr. Mrs. Jones' clothes out of the wardrobes and put them on. Napoleon himself, peering in a black coat, rat catcher breeches, and leather leggings, while his favorite sow appeared in the wadded silk dress which Mrs. Jones had been used to wear, wear on Sundays. A week later in the afternoon, a number of dog carts drove up to the farm. A deputation of neighboring farmers had been invited to make a, tout, or a tour of inspection. They were shown all over the farm expressed a and expressed a great admiration for everything they saw, especially the windmill. The animals were weeding the turnip field. They worked diligently, hardly raising their faces from the ground and not knowing whether to be more frightened of the pigs or of the human visitors. That evening, loud laughter and bursts of singing came to the farmhouse. And suddenly, at the sound of the mingled voices, the animals were stricken with curiosity. What could be happening in there, now that, for the first time, animals and human beings were meeting on terms of equality? With one accord, they began to creep as quietly as possible into the farmhouse garden. As the gate they paused, at the gate they paused, half frightened to go on, but Clover led the way in. They tipped up to the house, and such animals as were tall enough peered in at the dining room ta a window. There round the long table sat half a dozen farmers and half a dozen of the more eminent pigs, Napoleon himself occupying the seat of honor at the head of the table. The pigs appeared completely at ease in their chairs. The company had been enjoying a game of cards, but had broken off for at moment, for the moment evidently in order to drink a toast. A large jug was circulating, and the mugs were being refilled with beer. No one noticed the wondering faces of the animals that gazed in at the window. Mr. Pilkington of Foxwood had stood up his, mu mu up his mug in his hand. In a moment, he said he would ask the per present company to drink a toast. But before doing so, there were a few words that he felt incumbent, incumbent upon him to say. It was a source of great satisfaction to him, he said, and he was sure to all other present, to feel that a long period of mistrust and misunderstanding had now come to an end. There had been a time, not that, he or any of the present company had shared with sentiments, but there had been a time when the respected proprietors of Animal Farm had been regarded, he would not say with hostility, but perhaps with a certain measure of misgiving. By their human neighbors, unfortunate incidents had occurred, mistaken ideas had been current. It had been felt that the existence of a farm owned and operated by pigs was somehow abnormal and was liable to have an unsettling effect 
in the neighborhood. So many farm farmers, too many farmers had assumed without due inquiry that on such a farm a spirit of license and discipline and discipline would prevail. They had been nervous about the effects upon their own animals or even upon their human employees. But all such doubts were now dispelled. Today he and his friends had visited Animal Farm and inspected every inch of it with their own eyes. And what did they find? Not only the most up-to-date methods, but a discipline and an orderliness which should be an example to all farmers everywhere. He believed that he was right in saying that the lower animals on Animal Farm did more work and received less food than any animals in the country. Indeed, he and his fellow visitors today had observed many features which they intended to introduce on their own farms immediately. He would end his remarks, he said, by emphasizing once again the friendly feelings that subsisted and ought to subsist between Animal Farm and its neighbors. Between pigs and human beings, there was not, and there should and there need not be, any clash of interests whatever. The struggles and their difficulties were one. Was not the labor problem the same everywhere? Here it became apparent that Mr. Pilkington was about to spring some carefully prepared witticism on the company, but for a moment he was too overcome by amusement to be able to utter it. After much choking, during which his various chins turned purple, he managed <laughs> to get it out. If you have your lower animals to contend with, he said, we have our lower classes. So they're turning into exactly what they, the humans... But, you know, that's what people do, you know. Whenever humans are in control, they've always got to have someone to kick around. This uh, bone moat set the table in a roar, and Mr. Pilkington once again congratulated the pigs on the lower rations, the long working hours, and the general absence of pampering which he had observed on Animal Farm. Now, he said, finally, he would ask the company to rise to their feet and make certain that their glasses were full. Gentlemen, concluded Mr. Pilkington. Gentlemen, I give you a toast to the prosperity of Animal Farm. Oh, there's Chloe in the back, just watching. There was enthusiastic cheering and stamping of feet. Napoleon was so great gratified that he left his place and came round the table to clink his mug against Mr. Pilkington's before em emptying it. And the cheering had died. Down, Napoleon, who had remained on his feet and intimated that he, too, had a few words to say. Like all Napoleon's speeches, it was short and to the point. He, too, had, he said, was happy that the period of misunderstanding was at an end. For a long time, there had been rumors circulated here, reason to think, by some malignant enemy, that there was something subversive and even revolutionary in the outlook of himself and his colleagues. They had been credited with attempting to stay, stir up rebellion among the animals on neighboring farms. Nothing could be further from the truth. The sole wish now and in the past was to live at peace and in normal business relations with their neighbors. This farm, which he had the honor to control, he added, was a cooperative enterprise. The title deeds, which were in his own possession, were owned by the pigs jointly and not the other animals, as you can see. He did not believe, he said, that any of the old suspicions still lingered, but certain Changes have been made re recently in the routine of the farm, which should have the effect of promoting confidence still further. He, the third toe, the animals in the farm had had a rather foolish custom of addressing one another as comrade. This was to be suppressed. There had always been a very strange that there had always been a very strange custom whose origin was unknown. Of marching every Sunday morning past the boar's skull, which was nailed to. A post in the garden. This too would be suppressed, and the skull had already been buried. His visitors might have observed too the green flag which flew from the masthead. If so, they would perhaps have noted that the white hook and horn with which it had previously been marked had now been removed. It would be a plain green flag from now onwards. He had only one criticism, he said, to make of Mr. Pilkington's excellent neighborly speech. Mr. Pilkington referred throughout the animal farm. He could not, of course, know, for he, Napoleon, was only now, for the first time announcing it, that the name animal farm had been abolished. Henceforward, the farm was to be known as the manor farm, which he believed was its correct and original name. Gentlemen, concluded Napoleon, I will give you the same, so they're coming to 360. Whenever 
any type of animal is, because humans are animals anyway, so whenever there's control of one person over another, or one animal in this case, then there's always going to be a lust for power, and there's always going to be someone that is going to take over and and for, for their own benefit, which is what Napoleon did. So that, and it's, and it's always for their own benefit. They use violence. Violence is always their call, calling card. There was the same hearty cheering as before, and the mugs were empty to the dregs. But as the animals out side gazed at the scene, it seemed to them that some strange thing was happening. What was it that had altered in the faces of the pigs? Clover's old din dim eyes flitted from one face to another. Some of them had five chins, some had four, some had three, but what was it that seemed to be melting and changing? Then the applause having come to an end, the company took up their cards and continued the game that had been interrupted and the animals crept silently away. But they had not gone twenty yards when they stopped short. An uproar of voices was coming from the farmhouse. A good girl. They rushed back and looked through the window again. Yes, a violent quarrel was in progress. There was shout were shoutings, bangings on the table, sharp suspicious glances, furious denials. The source of the trouble appeared to be that Napoleon and Mr. Pilkington had each played an ace of spades simultaneously. Twelve voices were shouting in anger, and they were all alike. No question now what had happened to the faces of the pigs. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man. Again, but already it was possible to say which was which. That's the end of the book Animal Farm. We are now going to do the summer and analysis, and that will be the end of this playlist. Okay, let's get there. Summary to chapter 9. After celebrating the so-called victory against Frederick, the animals began building a new windmill. Their efforts are again led by Boxer, who despite his split hoof, insists on working harder, getting the windmill started before he retires. Poor Boxer. Food supplies continue to diminish, but Squealer explains that they actually have more food and better lives than they have ever known. The four sows litter 31 piglets. Napoleon, the father of all of them, orders a schoolroom to be built for their education. Meanwhile, more and more of the animals' rations are reduced while the pigs continue to grow fatter. The 1%. Animal Farm is eventually proclaimed a republic, and Napoleon is elected president. Just like in our government, they uh, have uh, national health care, but they don't want you and me to have that. So, And they have it for life. But they, they call it entitlements for us. We don't deserve it, you and I. Or they, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they scare the people to death, you know, because they parrot them like the sheep in the, uh, in the novel that go bleeding. Once his uh, hoof heals, Boxer works as hard as he can at building the windmill until the day he collapses because of the, a lung ailment. After he is helped back to his stall, Squealer informs them that Napoleon has sent for the veterinarian at Willington to treat him, but we know who that was. When the van arrives to take Boxer to the hospital, however, Benjamin reads its side and learns that Boxer is actually being taken to the nagger, a glue boiler. Clover screams to Boxer to escape, but the old horse is too weak to kick his way out of the van, which drives away. Boxer's never seen again. To placate the animals, Squealer tells them that Boxer was not taken to the knacker, but that the veterinarian had bought the knacker's truck and had not yet painted the words on its side. The animals are relieved when they hear this. The chapter ends with the grocer's van delivering a crate of whiskey to the pigs who drink it all. Do not arise in the afternoon the following day, so they get drunk on... Uh, the spoils of uh, Boxer's death. Gross. That's what our government's doing to us. Boxer's death in this chapter marks him as the most pathetic of Orwell's crea creations. Completely brainwashed by Napoleon, he lives and dies for the good of the farm. A farm whose leader sells him to a knacker the moment he becomes unfit for work. His naivety and looking for forward to his retirement and pension fulfilled it's the promise of the white line down his face, which Orwell tells the reader in Chapter 1 gives him a somewhat stupid appearance. Even when stricken and unable to move, Boxer can only consider what his ailment will mean to the windmill and his 
pipe dream of retiring with Benjamin and learning the remaining 22 letters of the alphabet was as far flung as Snowball's Utopia and Moses' Sugar Candy Mountain. Well, maybe when they die, they will go somewhere. I believe we do. Not, maybe, not, maybe not the way they describe the Bible, though I believe there's more. Otherwise, we wouldn't be created with... That's just my... The scene in which Boxer is taken to his uh, death is notable for his depiction of a powerless and innocent figure caught in the gears of unforgiving tyranny. Note that the van's dri driver wearing, wears a bowler hat, a symbol throughout the novel of cruel humanity. And you know that uh, the pay, uh, Napoleon is wearing that hat, too. Although Boxer tries to kick his way to the van, his previously incredible strength has been through days of mindless hard work in the service of his tormentors reduced to nothing. Only in his last moments does Boxer begin to understand what is happening to him, but the knowledge comes too late for anything to change. This chapter also continues to display Squealer's manipulation of language for the pig's political ends. In his famous essay, Politics and Li English Language, Orwell discusses the many ways that our language becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but also argues that the slovenliness of our language makes it easier to have foolish thoughts. Like those, <laughs> It seems like to me like those memes that they create. They create these memes that people uh, take for gospel. It's craziness. Or these ridiculous words that they use. Legit is the one that annoys me. I mean, not everything, <laughs> or or everything's literal. Not everything's lit. But those are just uh, those are words that come and go. At least in the popular language. I mean, they're they're regular words, but they, sometimes people go through words and they use them where they don't belong. <coughs> okay but also argues that the slovenliness of our language makes it harder to have foolish thoughts. In other words, any corruption of language can and will have a corrupting influence on the ways in which we think about the very things that language struggles to describe. This process is illustrated in Squill's announcements to the animals about their shortages of food. For the time being, he explains, it has been found necessary to make a readjustment of rations. Readjustment. His use of readjustment instead of reduction is a subtle attempt to quell the animal's complaints about their stomachs. Reduction is a word implying less of something, but readjustment implies a shifting of what is already there. Yeah, to probably the pigs. This one hears uh, politicians speak of the need to increase funding of government programs instead of tax hikes, or the invasion of another country as a police action instead of a war. In politics and the linguist language, Orwell contends that such euphemisms are used because they prevent listeners from conjuring mental pictures of what is being described, which in turn lessens the amount of horror listeners can feel when considering the topic. This manipulation of language is again found when Animal Farm is proclaimed a republic with Napoleon, its elected president. The word republic connotes a land of self-government whose Citizens participate in the political process, but you know they're not. And that's what's happening in the United States right now, too. I mean, with big money involved. See, so they let me make you think that you're electing these people, but you got uh, money interests. They're the ones that are electing these people because they're putting the campaign money in there. And so <clears throat> those are people that they've elected because they've got to... They're there for their interests. They're there for the big money interests. They better do what they say or they won't be re-elected. So what happened to Kennedy? So, I mean, even though he may be a little bit better than Trump in his World War III, Biden is not really going to do much more for us either. I mean, I don't got much to say about him, either, but I, 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 I don't feel very confident because, you know, and, you know, as is, like, this book will show you that. Connotes a land of self-government whose citizens participate in the political process, as the word president connotes one who is of the dick citizenry, but who has been appointed by them to preside over, not control, the government. See, so there's a, in the United States, there's an underlying force that controls the government. There's 
as forces that we don't know of. They're, they're underground or what, whatever you want to call them. Some people call them the uh, <clears throat> the Masons or what is it? Illuminati. I, we don't know who they are, but it's somebody, and it's not really who you think it is. Of course, these words are outrageous jokes to the reader, but not to the animals who again and again swallow the pig's twisted language make themselves feel better, as Orwell slyly remarks, doubtless it has been, been worse in the old days, they were glad to believe so. Similarly, the animals are glad to believe. Squill's obvious lies about Boxer's final moments. You know, I mean, who wants to think about that? It's happened. What can you do? Best thing to do is to take down Napoleon, in which he supposedly praised both Animals Farm and Napoleon. This is Squill's most outrageous and blatant piece of propaganda. And the reader may well wonder why none of the animals raise the slightest suspicion about it. The reason is that they are afraid to do so. Afraid of Napoleon as dogs, of course. But also afraid of probing too deeply into the story and thus upsetting their own con consciences. Believing Squealer is easy politi easier politically and morally, they can excuse their lack of action by willingly believing Squealer's lies about the owner of the van, as Orwell ironically explains. The animals were enormously relieved to hear this, and when Squealer went on to give further graphic details of <coughs> Boxer's deathbed, the admirable care he had received and the expense of medicines which Napoleon had paid without a thought to the cost, lies, all lies, their last doubts disappeared, and the sorrow that they felt for the... <coughs> Comrade's death was tempered by the thought that at least he had died happy. <clears throat> <coughs> Words like admirable, expensive, and without a thought to the cost, all give animals license to excuse their own inaction. As Orwell wrote elsewhere, to see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle, a struggle that the animals doubtless are able to overcome. The return of Moses is like the destruction of the first windmill, used to the pig's advantage, a reader because he's talking of Sugar Candy Mountain, they're not going to try, they're not going to work on anything, on changing things in the farm. We figured, well, we got that to go to. God helps those who help themselves, though, right? <clears throat> a reader may wonder why the pigs allow Moses to remain on the farm and actually encourage him to do so by giving him a gill of beer a day. The reason lies in the effect Moses has on the animals. It's it's like uh, religion. They say religion is the opium of the masses. Well, that's what they're using right there. And Moses just happens to be their mainstream religion. Not spirituality and what have you. Okay. Again, recalling Marx's famous metaphor, Moses' tale of sugar candy mountain figuratively drugs the animals and keeps them docile if life now is awful. At least so Moses' tale, Moses tale implies it will not always be such. Therefore, the animals continue working, laboring under the hope that one day Moses' story will come true. And they use the name Moses to take the land of milk and honey. Napoleon's fathering of the 31 piglets suggests how saturated with his image and presence the farm has become. In biological sense, Napoleon is now creating the very population he means to control. His decision to build a schoolhouse for the pigs is reminiscent of such fascist organizations as the Hitler Youth, and his numerous decrees favoring the pigs, such as the one requiring all animals to step out of their way when approached by pigs. Recalls Hitler thinking thoughts about Aryan superiority. Also notable in this chapter is the great amount of ceremony that Napoleon institutes throughout the farm. The increased amount of songs, speeches, and demonstrations keep the animals' brains busy enough not to think about their own wretchedness. When Napoleon packs the meetings with the sheep in case any animals momentarily see past all the pomp and circumstance. It says the brief Napoleon orders to be made for Boxer's grave is a similar display of Napoleon's own ends, as is the elegy for Boxer that en he ends with the horse's two maxims in order to threaten the other animals. The fact that the pigs get drunk on the night of the 
Suppose Solemn Day of Boxer's Memorial Banquet betrays their complete lack of sympathy for the devoted but ignorant horse. Their drunkenness also makes them more like Jones, their former oppressor. I mean, I think that symbolizes a lot of people out there that are they're devoted but uh, ignorant, and I don't mean it as in stupid, but ignorant of... They don't really look into things. They don't try to look at... They just believe everything at face value. They're naive. It's sad. And these are a lot, a lot of very good people out there. I, I can't hate them, but I mean, I, I'm i frustrated. The summary and analysis to Chapter 10. Years pass, and Animal Farm undergoes its final changes. Muriel, Bluebell, Jesse, and Pidger are all dead, and Jones dies in an inebriate's home. Clover is now 14 years old, two years past the retiring age, but has not retired. No animal ever has. There are now animals on the farm, and the farm... Boundaries have increased thanks to the purchase to a Pilkington's Fields. The second windmill has been completed and is used for milling corn. All the animals continue their lives of hard work and little food, except, of course, for the pigs. One evening, Clover sees a shocking sight, Squealer walking his, on his hind legs. Other pigs follow, walking the same way, and Napoleon also emerges from the farmhouse carrying a whip in his trotter. The sheep begin to bleat a new version of their previous slogan. Four legs good, two legs better. Clover also notices that the wall on which the Seven Commandments were written has been, repaint, were written has been repainted. Now the wall simply reads, All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Eventually all the pigs begin carrying whips and wearing Joan's clothes. In the novel's final scene, a deputation of neighboring farmers are given a tour of the farm, after which they meet in the dining room of the farmhouse with Napoleon and the other pigs. Mr. Pilkington makes a toast to Animal Farm and its efficiency. Napoleon then offers a speech in which he outlines his new policies. The word comrade will be suppressed. There will be no more Sunday meetings. Yeah, because you're not comrades anymore, right? The skull of old Major has been buried, and the farm flag will be charged to a simple field of grain. His greatest change in policy, however, is his announcement that the animal farm will again be called Manor Farm. He's a traitor. Soon after Napoleon's speech, the men and pigs begin playing cards. <clears throat> but a loud quarrel erupts, and both Napoleon and Pilkington each try to play the ace of spades. As Clover and the other animals watch, the arguments through the dining room window, they are unable to discriminate between the humans and the pigs. The analysis. This final chapter depicts the complete transformation, not only in name, from Animal Farm to Manor Farm. It's like a 360-degree turn. There will never be a retirement home for old animals, as evinced by, evidenced by Clover, and the pigs kind of resemble their human oppressors to the degree that it was impossible to say which was which. The completion of the second windmill marks not the rebirth of Snowball's utopian vision, but a further linking of the animals and humans. I mean, Snowball had a utopian vision, vision, but he did say the killing was necessary, too, sometimes. And a true utopia, no. No, that's not a true utopia. So it was never possible with that mindset, anyway. But a further linking of the animals and humans used not for a dynamo, but instead of for milling corn and thus making money. The windmill's symbolic meaning has, like everything else, been reversed and corrupted. Animal Farm is now inexorably tied to its human neighbors in terms of commerce and atmosphere. Orwell has years pass between chapters 9 and 10 to stress the ways in which the animal's lack of any sense of history has rendered them incapable of judging their present situation. The animals cannot complain about their awful lives since they had nothing to do to go upon except Squealer's lists of figures, which invariably demonstrated that everything was getting better and better. As Winston Smith, the protagonist of Orwell's 1984, understands the government could thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event it never happened. This same phenomenon occurs now on Animal Farm, where the animals cannot recall there ever having been a way of life different from the present one, and therefore no way of life to which they can compare their own. Although Beasts of England is hummed in secret by some would-be rebels, no one dared to sing it aloud. 
Pigs have won their ideological battle as the party wins its war with Winston's mine at the end of 1984. Only Benjamin, a means by which Orwell again voices his own opinion of the matter, is able to conclude that hunger, hardship, and disappointment are the unalterable law of life. You almost have to get rid of everybody. And then you'd still, even if you've got like two people in the world, there's still going to be, or three, there's still going to be something. Humans just naturally inclined to want to control each other and be cruel to each other, unfortunately. While Clover's shocked at the sight of Squealer walking on two legs, the reader is not, since this moment is the logical result of all the pig's previous machinations. Napoleon's carrying a whip in his trotter, formerly a symbol of human torture, and dressing in Joan's clothes only cements in readers' minds what they have long suspected. The sheep's new slogan, as before, destroys any chance with thought or debate on the animal's part, and the new commandment painted on the wall perfectly and ironically expresses Napoleon's philosophy. Of course, the phrase more equal is paradoxical, but this illustrates the paradoxical notion of animals oppressing their own kind in the name of liberty and unity. And that's what happens every day in the world. When the deputation of neighboring humans arrive, the animals are not sure whom they should fear, the pigs or the men. Orwell implies here that there's no real difference, as he does with the pigs buying a wireless, a telephone, and a newspapers, and with Napoleon smoking a pipe despite old Major's admonition to avoid all habits of men. Pilkington's address to Napoleon is sniveling in tone and reveals his desire to remain on good terms with the intimidating leader of Animal Farm excusing all cruelty and apologizing for being nervous about the effects of the rebellion, Pilkington offers a stream of empty words said only to keep the wheels of commerce well greased. Note that the praises Napoleon, he praises Napoleon for making the animals do more work, less food. Flattery from such a man can only suggest the object of such praise is as corrupt as he who flatters. His final witticism, if you have your own lower animals to contend with, we have our lower classes, and according to them, again stresses the political interchangeability between the pigs and the men. The changes of which Napoleon speaks in his addresses are address are the final ones needed to make the farm a complete dictatorship. The abolition of the word comrade will cre create less unity among the animals. The burial of old Major's skull will figuratively bearing any notions of the dead pig's ideals. And the removal of the horn and hoof from the flag will ensure that the animals over which it was waves never consider the rewards of struggle and rebellion. Finally, the changing of the farm's name back to Manor Farm <clears throat> implies that everything has come full circle, while also implying that the farm is not in any sense the animals. Instead, it is the property of those, as Hamlet quips in Shakespeare's play, to the manor born the pigs. The novel's final scene in which Napoleon and Pilkington argue about two aces of spades brilliantly represents the entire book. After years of oppression, struggle, rebellion, and reform, the pigs have become cor as corrupt and cruel as their masters, smoking, drinking, whipping, killing, and even cheating, are now, are now qualities shared by both animals and man, despite Pilkington's professed admiration of Napoleon and vice versa. Neither trust the other, because neither can. Each is motivated purely by self-interest and not the altruistic yet ineffectual principles once expounded by Old Major. And that there is the end, summary and analysis, and the end of this video. But in the next video, we will be getting into J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye. And check out me, that next video in my next playlist. And you have a great night, and you stay safe and healthy.